Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Natalie and her team. Thank you to the city of Vienna for this, well, wonderful event and also wonderful uh, uh, venue for the event. Um, so this, I'm going to start and give you something of an overview talk because we have some other deep dives into some of the issues on monetization coming up later today and tomorrow. So I thought in my talk, uh, I would give some high-level kinds of insights and then some insights into three different kind of projects or topics that I'm involved in. Um, I hope my accent is not too strong for people. I hope I'm not speaking too fast. Somebody just wave at me at the back if somehow I get too fast uh, for people as I go. So this is a shot I took during COVID because what else do you do when you're walking within two kilometers or five kilometers during COVID walking around your home city? This is down uh, town, as they say now, uh, in Dublin of the Samuel Beckett Bridge across the River Liffey in Dublin. And I... Hmm. Does it go forward? Aha, press harder. Okay. And my city, I live in Dublin, but actually my university is about 35k west of Dublin in a town called Maynooth. Hence, the university is called Maynooth University. It's one of these interesting things where it's the second oldest university in the uh, uh, country, but also one of the youngest. Why? Because we were established as a seminary way back and then we split off and founded a kind of a secular public university, and I work in the secular public university. So we have castles and a cathedral, but then we also have the modern on the other side of the road. So this is another shot. This is Clontarf in Dublin. Just thought I'd add some pretty pictures as we go through the talk as well. So this is what I want to do today and want to, to talk about. I, I'm actually a social scientist who studies games. I work in a sociology department, although my PhD was in communication. So somewhere a mixed kind of interdisciplinary approach to studying games. And while I started off doing photography and media production as my undergraduate degree, I then moved more and more into studying who makes media and also who plays, creates, and how these have become increasingly enmeshed as we look at different media. So I've always tried to place games in the context also of what's happening in other media around them. So as we go through this, I'll give you a little bit of an insight. How many people here are game researchers or would call yourself game researchers? Okay, great. Policy makers, stroke in public policy. Don't be shy, yeah. Gamers? Yeah, that's the crossover, right? Okay, so hopefully there'll be something in the talk for everybody as we go through this. Okay, so I've been my, since my PhD, I've been studying digital games, and some of the things I studied that were innovative then, some of you will never have probably heard of or don't remember unless you go to a games museum, like the iToy, for example, which was the big innovation with PlayStation 1 in 2002. Yes, people are laughing. Um, but my first in uh, conferences I went to in the UK and in Tampere, uh, we were looking actually at issues around gender and games. So already at that period, there was quite a bit of research starting to look at representations of women in games, and then also looking at how and where women could be participating, particularly in public game cultures. It was one thing to be playing on your PlayStation at home, but then to go to LAN parties, where you usually had to bring your equipment in those days, um, it was much more difficult for women to becoming involved. So already, if you look back to the libraries of the Digital Games Research Association, which had its first conference in 2003, and if you search through the library, you'll see some of the same types of topics that we've already seen brought up in the first panels in this conference. Um, so I think this is kind of interesting because I also came to Vienna to a conference in 2006. It was called the Gap Conference. It was run by Doris Rush and Martin Pilcher, who I believe is now in ITU. Doris, I'm not sure where she is actually. And the big thing we were talking about is, what is the games industry worth? How much value is created in financial terms by the games industry? And you know what? We didn't really know because the companies didn't really have the data 
Governments didn't collect it. There was no category mostly for games companies. So it was somewhere between publishing and software and nobody really knew. You know what, in two years time, we'll probably get the first NACE categories for the games development and publishing. And for the first time have agreed categories across international levels on gathering data on the games industry that's actually comparative, comparative and independent of the games industry itself. So it's only taken over 20 years to get here. But the thing that everybody was saying at this point is that games are bigger than Hollywood. It was a really good tagline. And guess what, if you look today, they're saying games are bigger than movies. But of course, what was Hollywood? It was box office, right? They ignored DVD and they ignored all of the other ancillary parts of the industry. And when we talk about movies today, that's also nicely ambiguous. Does that include all of the merchandising and all of the streaming and the other things? So actually what's really difficult for us to understand if we're interested in the value, economic value of the games industry, is to actually bring together that data. Especially as we get more and more monetary streams of all sorts of things. So yes, we might pay for a game up front, or maybe we don't, and we pay for in-app purchases. And then maybe we have merchandise. And then maybe we go to an event. How do we even capture? I would say the data we have is really quite poor and inaccurate in many cases on the value of the digital games industry at the moment. Um, if we go through the first wave of kind of books of the games industry in that period from 2000 to say 2012, you'll see the focus is very much on North America, on Japan, for good reasons, on the UK, Britsoft games industry in the UK. And these are just some of the kinds of books that we see from then. We also see, if people can hopefully read at the back, some of these books which were focused on gender also on how to address gender in game design, not just on the representations, doing analysis of the games as text, also looking at how can we improve game design. And these issues have stayed with us, I would argue, until the present day. In the post-2012, we see a kind of broadening out of where we look to try and understand the value of the games industry. Because post-2012 and the launch of the app stores and the mobile stores, we also got an awful lot of independent companies popping up in many different countries. At least in Ireland, this was the case. We had our EAs, we had our Microsofts, but now we had two-person companies, one-person company, producing a game on mobile and launching it on the app store. I'm sure it was the same here in Austria as it was in other countries, right? So in countries like France and those countries, you still had your big, uh, uh, large game companies, but now we also had smaller companies. And we started to see research as well on people that we mightn't have thought of as part of the games industry. The game testers, the community managers. But guess what? When you talk to the people in these roles, they see themselves as part of the games industry, right? As we now start to see YouTubers, streamers, and other people who see themselves as part of the games industry. So we really are seeing a diversification of different occupations across the games industry. This has also happened as we start to look at representation in the games industry. We're seeing a move away from just focusing on women and on gender to much more intersectional work and work on queerness in games, both in game design and in game cultures. If you don't know any of this literature, I'm sure these slides will be available and you can follow up or I'm happy to give some of the references afterwards. So back to the topic a little bit and I bring this in because what do we even mean when we're talking about money? What do we even mean anymore? Everybody thinks, at least first, we think, right, money, hard cash, used to be hard cash material in our pocket, right, that it was a medium of exchange. It tended to be controlled by central governments and, for many of us, also the European Central Bank, right? Uh, but there are some really interesting sociological studies on money. This is where a historical uh, um, text, what do we mean by money? And they're saying that, okay, we have formal money, but then, actually, we also have lots of private currencies. We have tokens. We have exchange. We have patterns and cultural ways of understanding money. When I give money as a tip, 
What is that? Is that about status? Is that about recognition? When I give my children a piece of money, a little bit of money as a reward, when they get pocket money. All of these things are outside of the formal exchange of money. This is more to the social and cultural aspects of money in everyday life. And I have a really good student, Young Ing Lee, who's studying the digitalization of money. And we've been, she's been helping me delve into some of these kind of texts about what money means. And of course, today, this is a book actually is just launched by one of my former postdocs, Rachel Dwyer, called Tokens. And she's looking at the diversification of forms of money, not just in games, but across all areas of life. Whether it's poker chips, whether it's when we come in here and we have other ways of exchanging for money as we go through it. When we look at mechanical Turk workers who are paid in gift cards. When we look at remittances going between countries where it's sent in phone credit. This is not about what we used to think of as money. This is a really, a really diverse term these days. And what does it mean for states when there's all these different types of money that they can't tax necessarily, that they can't control? Well, you know what? Actually, if you look back historically about 150 years, there were loads of private currencies that weren't controlled by the state. We actually then, with the establishment of states, got state-controlled monies. So it's interesting to look back and to see how people, particularly women in some working class families, used to put money in jars and say, right, this is for our holiday, this is for our groceries, right? And how different people in the family would control money. So let's think about money in both that social and cultural aspect as well as in the kind of hard currency, formal currency that is controlled by the state. So, but what we see in both the private currencies and the state countries, currencies is this is about power and control. Right? If we start to look at digital platforms and digital banks, they're now becoming intermediaries in control of money. And this is where things are getting a little bit more tricky. Because some of the different types of uh, digital services, including in games, could actually be stumbling into the territory we call a bank. And therefore, some game companies are finding that they're coming up against banking regulation. Right? They're having to do ID recognition to see if somebody is over the age of something or under the age. Right? They're actually having to check and become data controllers because they're controlling data. And so they're having to monitor money, um, money flows and think about money laundering in their games. That's not something the game companies 15, 20 years ago had to really think about, is how much money laundering is, might be happening in my game or game space. And this is where they're starting to, you'd have to think, we should be thinking about what, when does a game company or game service become actually also a bank or bank-like. So what do we know and what is the kind of value of games? Well, as we go through, we can think of the social and cultural value. Those of you who are in game studies will know this literature incredibly well uh, um, on the theories of games, looking at festivals, looking at cultures, looking at the tradition of play. In Ireland, this is in our National Museum. This is a Viking board game. Uh, so we can see this really long heritage of games and game culture uh, in many, many different countries. But then when we look to small indie games, we can see a real richness of different types of games that go way beyond the blockbuster names that we know and love. This is a real small indie company in Ireland called Dreamfeel. Uh, they have been producing games based on diaries, based on identity stories, looking at creating lovely kind of flat 2D but also 3D types of games and releasing them. Really, really innovative but really personal types of stories. We then have other types of games which are being produced obviously in schools or for schools. This was an Erasmus Plus project that was um, led from Ireland but had four or five different uh, countries involved where they produced adventure games for secondary schools which was to teach about gender identity. What I loved is they took the kind of space invaders kind of tropes in some of it. So of course you want to shoot down all of the sexist tropes, all of the stereotypes that you might engage in in your everyday life. And that's free to download if you're interested in finding it. It's the GE game, the gender equality game. And then just uh, two years ago, ooh, how do I go back? Ah, good. Um, we were involved in 
Okay, remind me never to get involved in developing an actual game again. This was such hard work. I was working with an artist and a programmer to develop a game around algorithmic bias. And this was shown, this was an installation which was shown in the Dublin Science Gallery alongside a lot of other installations. We were trying to get the general public to understand um, bias in content media moderation. So, you know, we can see here a kind of a breadth of the different types of roles of games and the kind of social and cultural values of games. So when I then try to look at the economic or the financial values of games, I try and actually approach it from the kinds of ways in academia we love to look at film and television and the other media print industries as well. So for those of you not familiar, um, there's a French tradition of cultural industries research. And I've been kind of drawing upon some of that, Bernard Miege in Grenoble, looking at Raymond Williams, who's a cultural theorist, was a cultural theorist uh, from the UK, who studied how cultural products get made. Looking at artists, looking at companies, looking at all of these different relationships between publishers and developers. And I found this really useful to kind of bring some of this to bear, at least in the first decades of looking at games. Some of you might know the books by David Hesmontalge, which is a reader on the cultural industries. It's now in its seventh edition, eighth edition maybe. But from the third edition, they actually started to introduce games. Right? So all of the first editions were television as cultural industry, print media, books, all of this. But slowly they started to introduce games into these kind of general textbooks about the creative and cultural industries. And now we also have journals where we can go to, where academics and others, you can read. The Media Industries website is open access. And we see one of the papers in the current issue is on crunch in the games industry and working conditions. We also have another project, the Global Media Monitoring Concentration Project, led from Canada by Dwayne Winzek, which is looking at including games along all of these different media industries to try and figure out what they're worth, to dig into the data. So we're doing it so you don't really have to, right? Because this is going through the financial reports. This is reading all the media merger law cases, trying to find the best data we can on companies to figure out how much they actually are worth, not just what they say they're worth. And of course, realities, the realities of gaming conference, it's always about trying to find out what is the truth behind some of this data. So actually, you know, in some countries they have reasonably good data. I'm not completely familiar with all of the Austrians, so it'll be interesting to talk about it here. If you look at the US data, it was really clear that from 2012, digital had taken off in revenues, right? It was like they started to introduce it, they started to gather and recognize the data, and then it took off. And all of the value in, in the, uh, the way we understood the games industry before was all changed post kind of 2012, 2015. Because now we started to capture digital revenues, not just sales of CDs and discs, right? The old fashioned things, sales through retail shops. They started to track digital downloads. They started to track in-game monetization. And from this period, we're really starting to see these new monetization models starting to be captured, at least in some countries, in their data on the games industry. I'm not thinking you'll be able to read this chart, don't worry. But just to show you the type of work that's being done in this type of book. So uh, Joost van Zunen, who uh, used to work actually in a, a consultancy, a data consultancy, now works and lectures in NYU in New York, published this book in 2012, where he gathered a lot of this data. So we could see, well, how big actually is Sony in games? How big is Electronic Arts in games? If you strip out their other things, how big are they? How concentrated is the industry? So this is a pretty good book, and I believe he's working on another one now, which maybe will come out in, in another year or so. And we're talking to him as part of the Global Games Media Monitoring and Concentration Project to really dig into the games data to figure out how how do we add in all of the new monetization streams to really get a handle on how big this industry really is? Um, we, I wrote a piece as part of this handbook uh, which looked at both the economies in and the economy of video games. And we talk about that shift from games as a product to games as a service. And I also start to point to the fact that games as a service allows us to do a number of things. It allows game companies to better track what their players are doing. 
And we know that a lot of game companies, the bigger ones now are hiring data analysts, data scientists, or hiring in those services. The smaller companies are buying that as a service from the intermediary platforms like Steam or like Unity or things like this. So they have a better handle on what their players like, what they don't like. They can remove things that players don't like increase to things that players do like, do more target marketing of players with this type of data. So it's not just that post-2012 things went digital. It meant a complete change in some of the things that game companies were able to do in terms of gathering data. And we also saw the launch of these kind of getting stronger and stronger platforms like Steam, some of you will know from PC games. Uh, we then see the development of engines like Unity giving more and more services to game developers as well. So as we get to this point, you can look to um, a data analyst company like Newzoo. I don't know if many people have heard of them. They were in the, in the Netherlands. Um, you can get some of the reports for free and then you can obviously pay quite a lot of money for the bigger reports. So uh, uh, as an academic, we don't get the bigger reports, we get the smaller ones, but they help us to kind of situate the data that we're gathering ourselves, right? And just three things to point out of their latest report, right? Asia Pacific is the largest market globally, right? Not surprising, given the growth of the Chinese market, Japan and South Korea. North America is less, and then Europe would have to be seen as something of the third market in this kind of global context as we look at it, right? Mobile games are by now, you know, the largest segment, right? So when I started, it was console, and then mobile, I don't know, back in the day, like, you had to port a game for like 50 handsets if you had a mobile game, right? So you developed for one handset, and then you ported it across to like every other handset. So hence, mobile was not a big thing for game companies. That is an awful lot of work. Now what do you do? Upload it to uh, either iOS or, uh, and you work with the APIs, and you know that you're able to reach most mobile phones. That was transformational for people who wanted to make casual games. And you can see it's also been transformational in the types of games that are being produced. So as we go through this now and we look at the data for this year, right, who are the top companies globally? Well, not surprising, given the size of their market and the kind of protected nature of their market, Tencent is the biggest global buy revenue company of public game companies. Now, we don't have the data on all private companies, so I'm only talking about publicly uh, listed companies here, right? But Tencent, of course, is also a bank, a financial trading platform, a messaging service, and everything else that it is, registered in the Cayman Islands, but subject to Chinese regulations. And that makes it kind of unstable a situation for them in their home market. But they are, by a a great factor bigger now than Sony, Apple, and Microsoft, which are the next three biggest companies, right? And then you really have to kind of go down a bit further to find what we might call a pure games company, right? EA or uh, Activision Blizzard or NetEase. Interesting, of course, Microsoft is trying to buy Activision Blizzard. Looks like it may actually be just about going through and proved. So what we're seeing here are some really huge companies who are, if you like, banking a lot of the value, right? They're putting a tax on all of the, the games that are being downloaded through their platforms. They may be publishing first party, their own content, and then publishing third party content for other game companies as well. These are the mega companies that even if you are a small operator, you're gonna deal with one of the platforms. Is it Apple? Is it Microsoft? Or maybe one or two of them, right? So what you develop will very much be shaped by the kinds of affordances of the services that they offer or the platforms that they offer. Um, this data is available, I think, in the, in the, the free version of Newzoo, but you have to buy it if you want to dig into it any further than this. Right. Video Games Europe has released data looking at the European markets, but of course they only look at the five biggest ones. So sorry, Austria and Ireland are not in any of this data. Uh, for now. <laughs> um, so they commissioned Ipsos, and you can see that actually in the European context, the games industry is growing quite large uh, for all of these five um, uh, markets in particular. And this is the picture across, although things look like they stabilized in 2023 post-COVID, because people bought a lot of games during COVID, right? The market kind of went, woof. 
And now it's kind of stabilizing or dipping just a little bit as people have to go back to their everyday lives and maybe play slightly less games and than they might have done during COVID. Um, but we can see across Europe, we can see that the five countries, we can see a good, pretty good skew of ages now playing games across them. Of course, younger people are playing a lot of games. Uh, um, uh, so what this shows is actually the percentage people of that age group who are playing games and have played games. Uh, usually it's in the last month. I'm going to have to double check that one. Um, but you can also see some of the people my age and over are still playing, right? So the people like me who grew up with games, we're still playing. And now the younger people are also playing as well. Did my voice just disappear? Did I do something? OK. It's OK? Ah, oh, it's back. OK. Um, and we can see in Europe, again, mobile, mobile devices uh, are the kind of the biggest part of that market. So how do we understand this? We have console, we have PC, we have mobile, and now we have people, not just children, but also adults playing games. And this is important if we want to understand games, because some games are being designed for adults. Some games are being designed for very young people. And some games are somewhere in the middle where it causes all the problems, right? as to who and what age. But that was always the same with film, that's the same with books, that was the same with magazines. This is not a new challenge, okay? Um, so in um, my book in 2017, um, I looked at, at this point, this shift to games as a service, right? I don't write, write that many books. One a decade is enough for me, right? But, uh, and that's actually quite an interesting because you see like this change. I was trying to write this book for about five years, but it was really clear that there was all these shifts going on in the data. So the, you know, there was no point in bringing the book out in 2013 when they were only starting to see the shifts coming through in the data. But I was trying to look at what was the different values between these different, what had happened in games. Well, there's probably a couple of things. Some things are going out of date, of course. A couple of things are still probably uh, of use as we go through this book. Nearly all of the games now are networked. There's all the things where people were just playing at home, playing with their mates, bringing their, <laughs> bringing their uh, consoles to friends' houses. That's kind of finished now. Everything is pretty much networked. Um, you know, it, it's really the argument now is over what will be stored locally and what's just going to be in the cloud, right? Um, and so as we go through this, I had thought what's really interesting is we have still these production logics. I use this term production logics from Bernard Miege, from the French cultural industries theorists. And when you looked at console first, it was very much like book publishing. A company went and pitched a deal, went to a publisher and said, I have a game idea. I have a, maybe a prototype. I want you to fund it. Right? And they may or may not give you funding, and you might get funding for two years, and you go off and make your game, and you, get, you print it, and it goes gold, and you give a disc, and somebody then runs off all of the copies and then gets them to the shops. That was pretty standard old cultural industry stuff, right? And we could still see that when I started to interview people in that first decade of games. It was very similar to some of the things we were seeing in the other cultural industries. But from 2012, we saw new logics. We're starting to see esports develop. We're starting to see the mobile and mobile linked into social media, right? Linked into Facebook, linked into these. And so this was different. So for me, the industry was diversifying in its production logics. And this meant something if you were a developer, right? It was kind of hard for us as, as academics watching, but if you were a developer, are you going for a two-year cycle of production? Are you going for a two-month cycle of production? Do you need to launch something and then work on the marketing campaign, the influencers, and all of these things afterwards? These are different to me, at least, production logics. If I'm uh, trying to develop a game and bring it to market, I need to know what are the kinds of people I need to deal with, the distributors, the system, the affordances of the platform. So for me, what was really important about that shift in 2012 was also that circulation or what might come post the initial development of the game became, if not as important, more important. I think in the panel yesterday they were talking about putting $2 into marketing and one into something like that shift. Like that's even more important, I would say, since 2012. 
right? And it may not just be in marketing. It might be in your influencers. It might be in your user-generated content and trying to uh, work with that community to keep the game alive. So I call that the kind of circulation phase, right? Keeping it circulating, keeping it in people's mind. And then you will have the continuous revenues coming back to the company. And in fact, your game players can be your best marketers, can't they? And that's why people, of course, are going to influencers as well, right? So um, the other thing I saw, and you, this may be also happening in Austria, I don't know, is that governments were getting interested in supporting their local games industries, maybe through tax credits or something like this, to encourage actually locally produced content. Thinking about it from the kind of film or TV production was going, can't we produce games based on some of our own local stories, right? Think about what CD Projekt Red did in, in Poland, for example, taking old stories, taking books, turning them into games, but also taking things that weren't originally cultural products, but something that might be imbued with your local history tales, your myths and things from your own countries. So we're starting to see a lot of that. It started with France uh, and the UK in tax credit systems. Ireland has now introduced it. And these tax credits are given for producing locally relevant or linked to local culture type content, right? In most countries, that will mean you will not get a first-person shooter uh, funded, but you may get a lot of other types of games might be funded under some of these tax credit systems. Okay. So what I liked about the, the production uh, logic approach is I could look at the entire uh, set of people who were involved in producing a project from the time the idea was made to the time the game was launched to the time the game was retired. Right? That is how I would now approach trying to understand a game uh, uh, production, right? Not fixated on the technology, although of course the technology plays a role, right? So you have to know what kind of what platforms people are working on, but actually you might be on more than one platform. But who are the key brokers? If you're an actual developer of a game, you need to think, well, who are the key brokers? Who's capturing the value? Who will decide what I can and can't make as I'm trying to get into this uh, project? And then trying to think about, and this for me, was who are the workers and who is doing the actual work? Are they the developers? Are they the influencers? Are they the players? Are they a mixture of all of these? Actually, if you start by looking at production logics, you can include the players as much as you can the original developers of the content. Okay. So, of course, when I started to write this, I was looking at these games. I was looking at Farmville. I was looking at Clash of Clans. Uh, these are the ones post-2012, which took off and were huge. And we see the new monetization coming in. These were free to play. I mean, that's kind of ridiculous. I'm a cultural creator. I'm going to give away my content for free. Only academics do that, right? <laughs> but actually, yes, here we are. We see this freemium model coming into games with a bang around this period, right? We have a whole load of new types of roles being developed in development and then in circulation. And we see these great, interesting, and we see advertising coming back. And I think it's probably become even more so now as data starts to become under GDPR. We're starting to see companies move a little bit back towards advertising. And I think users are a little bit more open to it in certain cases as well. So we're seeing advertising also coming back into games a lot more than we had seen in the 2012. Uh, this is the main street in Dublin, as is Pokemon Go of course, uh, and speaking of new monetization models, of course, starting to look at what they're doing, uh, and then also looking at how Fortnite then moved into Battle Royale. So this is kind of interesting when we want to understand production logics in games. Looking at this combination of social media and mobile and free to play, I think is a really interesting, it's not the whole industry but it was this kind of rapidly developing area for about 10 years. And it opened up the market to new players who rapidly got bought by the big players who are now part of the big players, right? So this is what the story entirely of these indies. And some of you will know this person who's very rich now on the back of uh, Fortnite. Um, and of course, this, you know, as we start to think through this, we start to see companies playing with in-game monetization. And there was a lot of critique. If you went to GDC, if you go back through the vaults of conversations from game developers, a lot of critique of in-game monetization. A lot of companies did not want to do it. And some of those went out of business, right? So it was how do we do this in a kind of way that we feel comfortable with? 
our game players feel comfortable with, maybe more cosmetic than rather driving the game or the winning of the game. And they're still, I think, tweaking this in some companies. What is the best way to do it? It's not all or nothing. There's probably better ways to do in-game monetization and worse ways to do in-game monetization, right? And, you know, Fortnite, of course, was making huge amounts of money. And so here we can see it working, at least working for the company and the players. And we're also starting to see, of course, some of the problems because this is about chat, this is about multiplayer, this is about children in these spaces with chat and multiplayer and in-game monetization. So if there are games where you start to see kicking off into this space where things are starting to become problematic, but particularly for people who are worried about content or and contact, as they say in some of the regulatory literature, you can start to see that this is an important place to start to look at, right? You can get your Fortnite outfits, but also you can see in some of the research in the UK where they interviewed children about playing these games, they were saying, well, I have to have the latest skins and I have to have the latest outfits because my friends have them. And I can't be seen as poor or I can't be seen as uncool. So here we're seeing, you know, this is about status. This is about trading on status or socioeconomic status or display, if you like, in game. And these are some of the pressures on the children. It's not just about getting the money. We're starting to see the research where we look at why they want the money is also really important. That kind of uh, talking to the children about their experiences. This, this is uh, um, actually from the UK Kids Go Online, the, the big UK, um, it's actually Global Kids Go Online now, if you don't know it, led by Sonia Livingston from the LSE. And a lot of those reports and, and surveys with children are all online if you'd like to, to read uh, some of the things they have found. The second logic um, that we, uh, I thought was really interesting, of course, was eSports. It was about the performance and the watching of games. Now this was also, now we always had watching in LAN parties, right? There were some of us who, some games were beyond us and I was a watcher on a lot of them, right? But that was really interesting. And for a lot of women, they also were very much often in the watching roles. But now we've like see a new way to kind of monetize the watching roles, right, in esports. And this also really took off from 2000, or 2012, and we see games being designed to become spectator or competition type games, right? So this is really interesting. This book is by T.L. Taylor, Watch Me Play, which is a study of the earlier part of esports. If you don't know TL, she's been, uh, she was first, uh, did her PhD, I think, on EverQuest, then she was doing work on, on World of Warcraft, and then her latest book was on esports. So studying the whole tradition here of uh, massive multiplayer online games and then moving into esports. And you know, uh, while I'm struggling to find where to watch Ireland versus New Zealand this evening. If anyone knows a pub that's screening the rugby match, please let me know. Um, I could probably log into an esports event, no problem to, to see uh, remotely one of these games, right? So circulation is key, and thinking about uh, who captures the value, who are the key brokers, I think is important to understanding the value of the games industry. Data science is normalized. If I look at job boards all the time and you start to see what they're looking for, go to them, they see all the game analytics. What are they doing? Oh, sorry, I was taking out one. Ooh, sorry, sorry, pissing the wrong one, okay. If you look at it, they're actually saying they want data analysts who will work with the game designers, but also work with the marketing team, right? Somewhere in between. So they need to know the game design, something about the game design, and they need to know about the marketing. And the data analytics teams are often sometimes the data scientists working between that. In another paper we've been working with, I've been working with a computer scientist who understands the AI models a little bit more than I do, to look at the ways in which we can do predictive modeling in different things. We were looking at it in smart cities and other digital services, how the models are trained, and then how they're used to predict uh, what somebody will do. And this translates, of course, exactly into games where uh, they can actually almost predict what people are going to do before they do it. Of course, they can also know what you have done, but now they're also predicting what you will do. And this is also exactly the types of technologies now being built into gambling products. So I think there's some really interesting work to be done on how some of these new AI uh, approaches are being embedded into games. 
Uh, Riot now has a new esports studio. This slide probably should have been two back, but anyway. Uh, in Dublin, where they're actually, for Europe, they're doing e-broadcast. E so I'm hoping I might have a project at some stage in the future where I'll, I'll do a little bit of work here to study this kind of e-broadcasting -bro part for Riot, which is in Dublin. Something to think about in terms of in-game monetization um, is actually that there's still a very small number of people who pay in many of the games. And just as in uh, gambling as well, actually, they have their whales or they have their VIPs. And I think what's really important for us to think about is that uh, there's a lot of people who play these games and have a, a really great time uh, in playing them, and really there are no problems. But then there are also the people who play, who pay quite a lot of money in them, and some of those can well afford to do that, and some of those can't. And so I think, though, the ways in which the games are marketing themselves in-game to the game players is the thing we should be looking at. How they're tracking their game players, how they're advertising not just in the game but across the other social media platforms that the game player is actually in. So it's not just in the game itself. If I'm on Facebook game, right, and I'm also in meta and the meta universe and everything else as part of the kind of platform which is sharing data, they will also be marketing at me across all of these other platforms as well. So thinking about how in free-to-play and in this kind of platform economy things have changed is important to understanding the value of games. This might be a little bit uh, small, but here we can actually see the top grossing mobile games. If you go to Sensor Tower, you can go to App Annie and there's a few. Not surprising, it's a Chinese game. Uh, in fact, the top two, I think, are Chinese games. Um, the top one is Honor of Kings. You may have heard of it. No? Isn't this interesting so how, you know, top grossing games, because they're primarily in the Chinese market, but actually they are selling outside of it, um, they're making kind of mega, mega books. What I think is interesting is if you look at these games today, if you go down, we still have Candy Crush, Candy Crush Saga, but Candy Crush is still here, right? If you go down even further, uh, you've got, po sorry, you've got Pokemon Go there as well. So these games, these mobile games, are becoming brands, franchises that go on now for many years, right? Constantly being updated, constantly taking on lives of their own. Where are the other new, smaller titles? They may be making money, they may not but some of the top grossing titles are owned by the mega companies and actually are also um, part of these like long kind of franchises now for maybe 10 years or more. So if you look at some of these, I was discussing Honor of King Kings with one of my Chinese uh, PhD students. They're saying what's interesting about this is because of the changes in the Chinese market, the Chinese government is trying to encourage more Chinese content in games, right? They used to have a policy on healthy games. Now they have a policy on creating IP which is Chinese and then trying to sell it abroad. Sounds exactly like what we, uh, many of our European countries do, right? But this is, we, do a, we did a rough translation, let us carry the cultural heritage of China, right? And this came right on the back of a game which had been launched and was very successful, which had been developed in, in Korea based on Korean culture. So we see now this developing, taking local culture and building it into games. It's also, of course, Esports, it's available as a tournament available to play. Very interesting, it does all of the in-game monetization that we looked at. So it's brought together my social media uh, uh, mobile um, production logic with the kind of performance production logic. And of course, those of you who are involved in game production will remember Unity, uh, which is really interesting in terms of smaller companies and allowing and giving them the facilities to manage these kind of more complex value chains. Uh, and just finally, just a colleague of ours um, from the PEGI committee, Annie Meta Torg, who may be online listening, I'm not sure, has been f studying the Steam platform and the types of top-down and bottom-up markets in Steam and what they're enabling players to do and what they're not enabling players to do in terms of selling content, monetizing content, et cetera. She has a book that's just out this month, I think, maybe, uh, on games uh, in the platform economy, which is a case study of Steam, right, and the whole Steam economy. So she's your woman to go to to find out more on that. Okay, so what does this all mean? And let me, as we kind of move towards the end, think about game workers and game players. 
All right. Right. Well, because many of us are players, are workers, work with workers, talk to workers, maybe we're educating people we hope will get jobs uh, in these kinds of economies, right? So we're seeing, of course, these different types of roles, and it's always a struggle for us as educators to keep up to date, but it would have been the same in other cultural industries as well, right? Um, we have all these new tools to learn, new software programs to learn. Uh, I was very impressed with our YouTubers' uh, uh, endeavor in learning the, the uh, softwares in our, in our panel yesterday, right? Um, and we need to think about, one of the things that we used to think about in uh, uh, the creative industries kind of literature in film and book and television was the creative autonomy of the developer, right? Did they have the autonomy to develop their own new novel stories? Tell new kinds of interactive events if you move it into the digital space. Well, actually, there's more and more things which are probably limiting, but then also affording new types of games to be developed. So it's certain that some of the things that the companies were doing with data in the last 10 years will not be allowable in the next five years, right? With GDPR and with new things, certainly in Europe, it's just not going to be possible. There's certainly things as well around loot boxes, which are getting more and more attention. They're going to be outright banned or other things. So companies are getting a little bit, shall we say, shifty about what they can do in that space to continue earning, earning money. So this is not a free for all that it was. All of this is now shifting and policymakers are much more alert than they were. Uh, and the industry is kind of having to respond to it as well as us as educators, right? So let's just see a, a couple of things on the kind of games industry in Europe and the workers at this point. Again, this is from Video Games Europe. Uh, again, this is a free to download report. <laughs> so all of you be downloading your free reports after this. Um, you know, it's, no, it's not a huge industry by comparison with some of the others in terms of actual jobs, but I wonder again how they're defining who's in the workforce here because I don't think any of these figures are including our YouTubers or streamers or anything like this, right? If somebody can't even get registered for tax and, and there's no category for you as a streamer or a YouTuber or whatever, it's not going to be captured in any of this data, right? So, but still we can see that in the data that we have, we might have over 100,000 people people in the five countries, okay, so this is again, Ireland's not included in this one, uh, um, this is a survey, and we still see that there's not an awful lot of women, uh, um, you know, we're still maybe reaching the quarter-ish, and it's more in certain occupations than in others, right, so when you go into the content moderation, the marketing, whatever, you get more women, when you go into the programming and those areas, you get more men. And we've done quite a bit of research trying to figure out the kind of boundaries of who makes games and who sees themselves in the games industry. This is a paper we did with community managers. Community managers were banned from talking to researchers about their jobs and about their working conditions. We actually had to either um, say, you know, obviously completely anonymize who they were, who they were working for, or talk to people who had left the companies within six months, right? Many of these community managers were working for agencies who then worked for the companies, right? And they were located in Ireland, so, but I thought it was really fascinating. They felt they were passionate about games. They were driving community engagement, engaging with players, but they were facing all the sorts of issues we see elsewhere. Most of the community managers would never put their handle as a female sounding word or name right? Because then they get even more uh, aggro from the game players if something was going wrong in the game world if it was seen that the community manager might be woman. Okay, so um, I think it's really interesting for us to start to look at these. This is a book by Ergen Bullet, uh, one a Turkish scholar who fo focused on game testers and how they were often ignored, but a really important part of the games industry as well. And he's published a number of papers thinking about People who want to get into the games industry start by being game testers and they get completely demoralized because actually, you know, the pay can be very low. The types of work that you get to do may not translate into other areas of the games industry and they often burn out. They're literally burn out working as game testers. So these are really important studies of kind of, I would say, underexplored areas of the games industry. We did work with Game Workers Unite in Ireland, and it's not surprising that game workers are unionizing, 
right? Now, of course, it's illegal in some countries and it's difficult in other countries. This is a paper by Jamie Woodcock and others looking at the UK and looking at game unionization in the UK. In many cases, they're not even called unions, but what they are doing is they're doing collective organizing for better pay conditions, working conditions, uh, time and all of this. And we actually then, a branch was set up in Ireland, uh, Game Workers Unite, and I think what was really, this is the cake, the cake for launching uh, the union. They weren't a union, they were a section within another union, which was the Financial Services Union, right? And they couldn't be fully named. Only one person would stand and be named because none of them wanted their companies to know they were part of a union. So one of the really interesting things about an industry that is incredibly datafied and an industry that knows nearly everything about its players is that the workers don't know about other workers. And the workers can't even know their neighbor's salary in many countries. Now, maybe in Austria you have different laws about this, but this is how it's working in the UK, in the US, in Ireland, that workers are finding it really hard to collectively organize and then to advance their rights within their groups or their organizations. So we worked with them. We, uh, they were producing uh, a, a quick survey, and this is working with one of my PhD students, Josh Moody, who was doing work on the creative industries. We actually did a survey, and, and you know, I'm kind of running out of time here, and I won't go through the demographics. They're all there. Four issues came up, and they're exactly the issues we've been seeing for 25 years. They are issues in other industries as well. The first is pay. Unless you are a programmer, people in nearly all other, and sometimes a kind of a really rare musician, <laughs> person doing music, um, nearly all other occupations and people felt they were completely underpaid and certainly for the living costs of where they were living at the time. The second thing that really was working time. While they nominally had working hours, they were regularly going over working hours and expected coming up to deadline to do crunch, which many of you will maybe have heard of as a particular problem within the games industry. So when we think about who's creating value and taking value, in many cases it's not the workers, right? It is not the workers, or it may be in certain companies and people who have immense track records. The third and fourth things are also problematic. Getting a stable contract, and actually, what does that even mean, given all of the layoffs that's going on in the games industry just at the moment? Highly successful companies currently closing down projects, closing down teams, and a lot of really well-qualified people being let go. They're finding, you know, they have really unstable contracts, quite short contracts, or else their contract doesn't mean anything at all. And then the final thing is around harassment, bullying, and discrimination. It wasn't the same for everybody in the industry. It's very particular. It was to women. It was to minorities. It was to people who presented as not the average in the context in which they were in. This is pernicious. It's continuing. It's also in the game development companies, as well as in the community managers, as well as in those other areas. And the industry talks a lot about skills, about leaky pipelines, and yet it fails to address probably one of the most persistent or some of these issues, which are exactly why they are losing people from the industry, losing good people, losing talented people. So I think we really need to, I'm gonna skip a couple of things. Close your eyes for a sec, till I get to the very end. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll do this last one. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah. okay, I don't even know which way I went there at that point. So I think when we get to the end and we start to think, there's a couple of issues as I wrap up um, for us to think about. The industry itself is creating a lot of money, but there's a small number of com companies who are creating an awful lot of the capturing that value and banking it, if you like, right? And many of those companies are now owned by investors or by companies you know, who are like investment arms of banks and things like this. And that is really changing the nature of some parts of the industry. Game workers, some people are making good money, particularly in programming, but the industry is much broader than that. And as educators, we need to look much broader than that. And we need to try and find ways to capture the data. And we need to look at the kind of working conditions of those sorts of people. And as regulators, I think regulators are more and more on top, actually, despite maybe what some people say, on things that are happening in this industry. Because many of us as academics 
are actually now working with them directly to inform them to find data, to gather data, and to work with them on things, whether it is loot boxes, in-game monetization, whether it is about how to educate young people about what goes on in these game worlds, and also to educate parents to take maybe sometimes a little responsibility for what's happening in their homes and things like this. So if we are to avoid the gamblification, if we are to move beyond thinking about what the industry talks about responsible consumption, we need to think about responsible production and circulation and work. I think that's me. Yes. Yay. Thanks very much. <laughs>